from Derek. You can explain, there seems to be a concentration of street naming. These are the streets here in the United States named for Martin Luther King. Is there a pattern would account for that pattern of being in southeastern United States? Uh, yeah, well, and first of all, thank you for uh, highlighting this map uh, that was created by my students and I a few years ago. I I'm happy to tell you, though, that we've updated the data that this map and other subsequent maps are based on. And I can tell you that as of the Christmas holidays, that in the United States, we have at least 995 uh, mm. places with a Martin Luther King Street. So even though we know globally we have at least a thousand and, and, um, and more, we're reaching that mark just within the United States very quickly. Um, and, and what you can see from this map, which I think is pretty important, and you pointed out, Karen, is that, you know, uh, three fourths of those streets named for King are found in the southeastern United States. And that really shouldn't surprise us because we know that the, the South was not the only place the civil rights movement happened, but it was one of the early battlegrounds. It was where the movement took some of its formative uh, steps. We also know that King was a, a, a son of the South. His, his native state of Georgia has the most streets named for Dr. King. Um, but we also know that this is a national memorial practice. It's found in 41 states the District of Columbia, and even though it's not indicated on the map, also a few streets in Puerto Rico. Um, so it, it represents, as I've tried to suggest in other work, a, a, a national memorial change. It's a watershed mark in the way that we remember and I think publicize uh, African-American history and civil rights history. Well, you know, that, that leads me to a question, um, and this is for all the people, the participants who have, uh, who are online, and we've got a question, you know, what was or is the first city to name a street for King? And there's a poll that's come up and you can click, what, what was the first city to name a street for Dr. King? So you can have at it, uh, you, you know, I can't vote, the panelists can't vote, and uh, they know the answer. So um, if you can see the poll and uh, make a choice, do so right now. And we'll be tabulating the, uh, the, the responses and the answers very shortly. And uh, our behind the scenes people, Kayla, did you have enough to share the results? If so, here is the, here's the answer just months after King's assassination in 1968. Let's look at this. But here are the results. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, we have Birmingham. We just looked at the map of the South. Birmingham, 43%. Atlanta, next at, at uh, 41. Chicago and Indianapolis. Well, the answer is Chicago. And they named the street just uh, in, in 1968, months after King's assassination. Now that that's interesting, even though what we've said, and it's it's important because in, in this era we're in, as the nation divided and and uh, the South and the North have a history of tension through the years of the Civil War and people are threatening Civil War again. That um, we still have in a major metropolitan northern city immediately was the first to name the street after King and some of the dynamics that were going on in Chicago at the time. I've not that delved into, but it's an interesting uh, outcome to, to have. Um, okay, now Karen, here, could go I ahead. interject some, you know, uh, Chicago was special, not just because of being first, but it was in Chicago that we actually see the um, sort of the creation of a pattern. And, and in Chicago, there was a, a pretty lively debate uh, between the mayor's office and um, uh, city aldermen um, uh, including uh, some, some African-American uh, representatives who they, they were conflicted about what street to put uh, to, to identify with King. And so while a major street within the Black South Side ultimately was where King's name was placed, there were people who were pushing for a major expressway or even a street in the Central Business District that was going to be highly visible, very, very yeah. prominent to the entire city. And, and that pattern of 
in some ways segregating King's name to certain parts of the city has remained a pattern that we see happening to this very day. That's fascinating. So ultimately it went on the south side of Chicago um, and the notion being, as you said, that it had greater visibility through traffic and so forth, although a lot of people do travel the expressway. Um, in the end, I, I guess it's, uh, it, it stood and it, it remains Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, which is good. Now, years later, in 1979, the Detroit City Council recommended changing um, a street that goes, uh, intersects across Woodward, which is the main avenue here in Detroit. And um, they changed the name of Myrtle Street, which had been previous to Martin Luther King Avenue. And uh, so that was sometime a little bit later. Now we were talking about who was involved in the decision-making for street naming. This is interesting. This is the Detroit I mean, the Department of Public Works document that was approved by its director, James Watt, and then Councilman Clyde Cleveland, Cleveland approving the council to rename Myrtle Street uh, as, Martin Luther King, as Martin Luther King Boulevard. So here is an example uh, of city government being involved in street naming. But we've talked a little bit, maybe you could expand a little bit more. Who are the people who can make a decision about renaming or it's recommending a street name? We talked early on, Coretta Scott King, she lobbied as an individual. Here we've got the city of Detroit council making decision. Where does that usually rest? Derek or Earl, either one of y'all can take a handle on that. Earl, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, yeah, you can jump in as well. Um, just from the research that I've done, you know, typically, you know, uh, these things are proposed by like a local groups, you know, a church group or a social club or a uh, network of individuals that say, hey, you know, we want to change X, Y, and Z street, you know, after uh, MLK. And then um, what usually happens is that, you know, the people who live and, and work on that street, they have to get the approval of those individuals. So there's like a petition or there's like some type of uh, like awareness campaign that they have to kind of uh, build up and uh, get support for. And then once they are able to secure that kind of support, then that request goes toward the city. You know, in terms of where that goes, it, it may be different city to city, but there is this kind of grassroots uh, starting point that many groups have to, um, begin and then they had to send that proposal and in that grassroots kind of in engagement period that's when the friction kind of happens you know that's when it the, the the rubber really meets the road because now you have to convince people who live on a street to s voluntarily say yes i will allow my street to be named after mlk and in many instances as dr adam and others have shared that may not be the case because of whatever reason, political, racial, economical. So at that grassroots level is where I think we can definitely see the most change and there definitely needs the most kind of a TLC, I would say. No, I, I, think, that's, I think that's a perfect answer. It's exactly what I would say um, and more. Uh, the only thing I would add is that it's because of that grassroots element that makes these streets such powerful indicators right. of where we are as a nation in terms of race relations and I think equality and, and, and social justice. And if you notice here in Detroit, Martin Luther King Boulevard intersects with Rosa Park yeah. Yeah. herself um, in the Montgomery Boys uh, boycott. His legacy in terms of social justice and demonstrations and uh, and so you're, you're absolutely right that the grassroots are very important in being part of that discussion. And, um, you know, what's happening with names of street, of Martin Luther King streets, I don't know if it's a stereotype, but they're often sometimes in blighted areas. Um, but there is an effort by Earl to really examine the whole naming of streets. And uh, as I said in his introduction, he's a filmmaker. And toward that end, he's applied his creative art skills to a project 
uh, to look at MLK Street Gaming, and he's going to do a full feature documentary. But we're fortunate enough here today uh, to be able to uh, look at a, a short version of that. And Earl, knock it out of the park. Take it away. <laughs> Well, no, uh, thank you for that. It's just, you know, as uh, we have talked about the situation here, um, uh, because of the history and the, you know, pushback and all the negative things that kind of happen at that grassroots level when people want to name a street after MLK, a lot of times these community groups, these grassroots efforts have to kind of settle for plan B in, uh, in their efforts. And in doing so, they have to place a street in maybe a not so great side of town because they have to guarantee they have to guarantee community support. So they go to places that they can do that. And sometimes those areas don't have the proper support from the city. They they don't have the proper funding. They don't have the high performing schools that maybe they would have uh, wanted to place the street on originally. So um, all of these things, these racial things, these systematic things, these uh, economical, political. Um, really kind of just negative things that kind of swirl when the street happens, when the street naming happens, kind of form this really just storm of just, you know, darkness that puts the street in these kind of blighted areas. And that's uh, uh, fortunately a situation that's really happening across the country. And um, now, you know, uh, unfortunately, there's kind of a, a stigma that MLK Boulevard is located in kind of a bad part of town. And uh, I'm not sure if People are familiar with the uh, the old Chris Rock stand up, but Chris Rock has a stand up that talks about MLK Boulevard and how it's kind of in like a you know a wild side of town. It's on YouTube. You can Google that and, and uh, check it out. But there's this kind of stigma in the Black community and I think in the community in general that MLK is in a bad area. So we wanted to kind of take that idea and kind of flip it and say you know if if that's the stigma. How do people who live on MLK Boulevard feel? And, and if, if that's how they feel, then how can they change and how can they make an improvement? So with that in mind, we wanted to make a short film and also make an upcoming feature film that talks about that. Okay, we're gonna hear the voice of uh, the community in, in Earl's short film right now. It started as a dream, but it's become a nightmare on many streets that bear your name. I see hopelessness, violence, regret. See, it started as a dream, but it's become a nightmare. See, I was raised on ideals a caged bird can still sing, but I wonder if it has forgotten its voice on the streets of Martin Luther King. Hey, yo, nice shirt. Oh, good looking out, bro, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate it. <laughs> What's good? Hey, uh, would you mind helping me out? For sure. I'm doing the dramatic spoken word opening for MLK. What spoken word? It's basically just rapping without all the fancy beats. Uh, bro, I got you, bro. You sure? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, so uh, all I need you to do is look at the camera. Okay, well, I'm count to three. Yeah, what's up, mama what girl? Know. I'm out here, man. I told you your boy was gonna make it. You feel me? June June, two tone to 75th Street. She queen. Hey, I'm gonna have uh, Ain't no June June, okay? Ain't no okay. June June. It's just. Yeah, all yeah, I need yeah. you to do is do the rap, all right? Okay, okay, cool, 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 cool. So all I need you to do is look in the camera and you gonna, okay. you just gonna say it on three, all right? All right, yeah, all right, yeah. So one, two, three. Uh. Gotta get the bag. Hey, 
I'ma keep chasing rags, hey. Cooking up stuff like M.O.K. Okay, who? Hustling, hustling all day. I'm nightmare on MC. Whoa, 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 whoa. What are you doing? What, what are you, you doing? What you mean? This is about M.L.K. I his know. street, his legacy. Bro, I know. Mario love the hood. Who is Mario? Mario Lex Key. We call him M.L.K. for short. What? Unbelievable. Um, unbelievable. Bro, where are you going? Man, anyway, I'm about to get mine. Listen, Freddy Cougar with the five feet. Anybody mess with a real shit? I'm big worm selling out these things. Young fella, I know you're not tired. Listen, when I was your age, we used to run up and down this street, that liquor store right there, have a Mr. Johnny's candy store. As kids from school, we used to run up and down here all the time. Yeah, and now people run from the cops. Listen, it's not Rodell Drive or Miracle Mile in Chicago, but it, it ain't that bad. Bad enough to where I can't get an interview. Nobody's called me back in two months. I bet when they see MLK Boulevard on my resume, they probably throw it away. Oh, so that's why you did it, huh? Huh? Yeah. You came over the other night, you copied your resume, I took a picture of it. There it is right there. What's your resume? Why'd you use my address? I just, you know, I, I, I didn't want to be associated with anything negative. Well, what do you mean negative? MLK Street. This street isn't exactly known to be the home of the best and brightest of tomorrow. <laughs> hey, uh, you're my mentor. Can't you just give me a job working at your agency? You know I can do the work. I just finished my MBA program. I'm ready. Listen, I'm not into giving free rides. I became your mentor because I know how hard you worked on your MBA program. God isn't into making life easy for us. I don't want it to be easy. I just wish it didn't feel so hopeless. I tell you what, you should. You're gonna say I should pray, right? Look, I'm tired of praying. God ain't listening. Maybe he is listening. Okay, maybe God is waiting on you. God used men in the Bible, Paul and Noah and Moses. Those men were used in the Bible and God can use you as well. Tell you what, you refocus and get the street back to what it originally stood for, MLK, and I'll help you out. You give me a job? Listen, man can't work for somebody else and be wealthy. I'll help you start your own business, okay? All right. Now come on, old man. since grad school. Come in.
Uh, what is that? Uh, the question is, who is that? Her name is Melinda. Uh, it's a plastic face with fake hair on top. <laughs> Don't talk about Melinda like that. Okay, okay, I'm a little concerned. You may need professional help, I mean. <laughs> uh, I'm fine. I put Melinda in my car so I can ride in the carpool lane. Okay. <laughs> so, what's up? She's staring at me. I, I just, you know. Oh, gosh. Okay. Ooh, ooh. Okay, okay. 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 Don't need to get scared. <laughs> it's not going to bite you. It's a vegetarian. I'm fine, I'm fine. I just, uh, you know, thought a bird flew in here or something. Uh huh, <laughs> sure. Um, I, ne I need you to be my lawyer. Your what? My lawyer. I'm going to clean up Martin Luther King Boulevard, and I need you to act as my lawyer. Uh, but I don't know a thing about law. After I transferred from the MBA program, I went to art school, remember? <laughs> that doesn't matter. I just need you to act as my lawyer. All you have to do is show up to a couple business meetings and look the part. I'll take care of the talking. Most of the city officials are middle-aged white men. They may turn down talking to me, but once we get you a business suit, maybe some new heels, maybe some makeup, maybe get your hair done. What are you trying to say? Uh, the point I'm trying to make is this, is that when we get you ready, they won't say no to you. I'm not some hired working girl. Well, you're not working for free. But I'm not working at all. You never finished the art program, right? No. I, a couple bills got in the way, but it's still on my to-do list. What if I told you my mentor would be willing to pay for your art school tuition? Really? Well, I still need you to talk to him, but yeah, I'm sure he'd be fine with it. Are you sure? Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, yes. Yes. 100% sure. That's great. Melinda, we're going to NLK Boulevard. That's not what you expected, right? Wow. I guess I just don't come this way that much. Yeah, there's a reason for that. In my research, I found that at one time, a local group submitted a proposal for NLK streets to run throughout the entire city. Not just predominantly black areas. What happened? <laughs> White business owners from the Columbus district disagreed. They said it was too expensive to print out new business cards, create new advertising, new logos. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, I know. The reason MLK streets are often in rough areas is by design. Politics, money, racism are all a part of the problem. So what ends up happening is, the group who proposes the MLK Street location is forced to place it where they know they can guarantee community involvement. Oftentimes, it's in a not so great part of town. Are you sure we can do this? Yeah, I hope so. Well, we've got some work to do. Shirt. Oh, I appreciate it. Please man. do not encourage him. Yeah. You again? Bro, and what? with that same shirt on. Come on, bro. Man, listen, this is my favorite shirt, but it's it's clean though. I wash it, alright? Listen, my bad, bro. My bad for last time, alright? I've been learning a lot of stuff listening to dudes like Derek Minor. Got a new sound though. Uh I you wanna hear it? Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. Come on, come on, please. Listen, I pro I promise you you're gonna like it. Come on. All right, fine, bro, come on. All right. I can only speak through the perspective of a black American. Compassion for other races that we race against. We better than, better than that mindset we better than. I done seen bullets flow through a high schooler's letterman. I was told by the hood, you gon' sling rock, cut the pot, ain't gon' stop on the block, all for the brethren. I said, cool, I'ma sling the rock till I drop on the block, in the hood, understood, yeah, yeah. Only difference is my rock rose again, uh. Only difference is my rock will show again. He will get you higher than you ever been. He your sing. And it may seem like you losing, but you Cleveland, you gonna win. Uh. What you think? That was good. Hey, I appreciate you, man. <laughs> hey, hey, there you go. Good. Hey, man, I tried, man. Well, uh, let me help you out. Okay, what's, what's that? 
Holy shit. Is that something on my shirt? Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Good show, I feel it. You know that that's gonna come up as soon as he washes it though, right? Yeah, I know, but he looks good. Yeah, I appreciate it, man, for real. Yo, uh, maybe you can help us out. All right, what's up? We're going to clean up Martin Luther King Boulevard. Okay. Make it a street that really honors Dr. King. Yo, that's mad dope, like for real. And you already know I'm in. You already know I'm in, but like, what's the plan though? So the first thing we have to do is Okay, that was amazing. That's an amazing show. Every time I see it, I can't wait to see the full length uh, program that you're going to do, the documentary, Earl, because that is just amazing. You've got thank the you, thank you. I appreciate that. You've got the culture, you've got the sociological, you got some humor, which is always good. Right. You know, <laughs> all of that mix is there. And people, if you're listening in, if you want to chat or ask a question about this, one thing, Earl, I've got to ask. Um, I know you hosted a, a fundraiser and a mm -hmm. panel about this film on Sunday. Right. Uh, uh, tell us about what are the next steps in getting the film produced and what can we do to help? Oh, thank you for that. I uh, uh, really appreciate that, Ms. Hudson Samuels. Uh, just um, right now, we hosted a, a, a King Boulevard block party yesterday. It was a, like a virtual fundraiser. We talked about the film as well as we had some community panel members uh, from um, the various uh, King Boulevards across the country. Also, the uh, amazing and intelligent uh, Dr. Adaman was there as well. So uh, it, this project is really about the community, like the national community uh, of MLK Boulevards and trying to bring us together and help us really improve the streets from, uh, from a national consciousness standpoint. So um, the short film that we just saw uh, just a moment ago is like a 15 minute, you know, 16 minute piece that is like a small amount of what we want to do for a longer 90 minute feature version uh, that will come out like on Hulu or Netflix or probably like a drive-in now because everything is COVID. We can't go to the actual <laughs> movie theater anymore, but um, something that we would show on a grand a, a grander scale and then use that as a um, just a thought starter and a conversational piece to really get the ball rolling for more support, more community involvement, more awareness, more um, just eyeballs on this issue because it's something that's bubbling underneath the surface. But once we believe this film kind of comes out at a really, uh, really good rate, a really good quality, people will really be able to say, wait, there's a problem here. Let's really do something to kind of make some changes here and improve these streets. So we have a website. I think it's in the chat there, um, kingboulevardfeaturefilm.com. And you can go there, you can support the film financially if you want. We are partnering with a local uh, LA nonprofit. So all the proceeds that we raise will support them. They're called CBG Arts. Uh, they are uh, like a youth dramatic art, uh, arts group that go into the uh, underserved population, black and brown communities of LA and help them express themselves through like dancing and singing and, uh, you know, rap arts and rap and painting and things like that. So a portion of the money will go there and also a portion will help us make this film. So anything you could do or referrals or financial things um, will definitely be appreciated. And we are just trying to move this ball forward and hopefully by next uh, 2022, MLK Day. We'll be celebrating a feature film that we can invite you all back to check that out. Well, you know, there, there are a couple of places right here in Detroit that we'd love to be uh, a location for one of your um, the debut. That would be fantastic. And you know what? It, it raises the question, as you're looking for a springboard to get this going, it goes to the, the new generation of urban planners and architects 
Right. And and they're learning. I mean, that's active right now. They're, they're making decisions. On Wednesday, we're going to have a new administration. Yeah. Um, Derek, what do you think? How I mean, would urban planners be able to, if they're looking at this going in the future, what is the role the film could influence could have on uh, decision making? Well, no, thank you for that question, uh, Karen. And uh, just want to congratulate Earl and his colleagues on such a magnificent uh, piece of art and piece of commentary and, and social analysis. Um, you know, I, I believe that the film, and I've seen it now numerous times, and it just it's fresh every time. I just love it. Um, it speaks to me, and I think it could speak to urban planners and those uh, geographers and other scholars like me. Uh, and, and in the sense that it's critical storytelling, it's, mm -hmm. it's forcing people who watch it to go beyond the stigma, to go beyond the stereotype and to humanize an issue that has long needed to be humanized. I think, you know, it, I, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that right behind Earl's head there, uh, he has a, a background that I'm envious of. Uh, he has a Martin Luther King street. And so many times that street sign keeps us from seeing the communities behind that street name and that road. And this, this film uh, demands that we take a notice of those people. I, you know, I also think that this film for urban planners can speak to and raise the consciousness of the, the, the activism and the tensions that run through communities as they try to do justice to King's memory. I mean, I think it gives them an insight into the power of an address the power that that address has in people's lives, negative and positive. Um, you know, I, I also think it in many ways speaks to an ethics of care that we in this country uh, at the official level, uh, and I'm talking about the White House down to the state house, down to the local city council, we've lost an ethics of care for black people and black communities and black places. And I think this film demands that, that we pay attention and it says, you know, look, an individual can make an impact, but in the case of urban planners, they're part of an institutional framework. They're part of an official body of decision makers. And I really think uh, as, as someone who works with some of those communities in urban planning, um, this is a wake up call that they have a accountability. They have a responsibility to play in, in this effort that Earl and his colleagues have, have so well defined for us. Boy, that is just an outstanding summary of everything we've said there. It's just, it, it, it really ties all of those uh, elements together. And Earl, I know in the film you, you've gone to the community. Uh, there's a, a person you, that you're trying to work with uh, to get some support. And I'm thinking if you're looking at the businesses and so forth that are on Martin Luther King Avenues today here in Detroit, there is a major institution that you might want to tap for support. Now, the university, what is it, Mercy, University of Mercy College, their school of dentistry is on a beautiful campus on Martin Luther King Boulevard. A lot of people don't know the school of dentistry is there. Detroit Mercy College is school of, you know, and that, 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 their awareness, that their location, I don't know how long they've been there, but it's significant. Um, I'm going to pause right now because we have our third panelist who's uh, come to join us. That's Jamon Jordan, who might have to unmute himself momentarily. Jamon Jordan um, is a local historian, well known here in the Detroit area, and uh, he heads up uh, Black Scrolls Network, Black Scrolls Network, which is a bus tour group that does. Uh, takes people on visits, and we're going to actually do virtual bus tours of Black Historic Sites Committee, which is something that uh, Jamon will be involved with. So we're glad that you're able to join us, Jamon. I don't know what, what part in the uh, program you were able to come in. We just saw Earl's phenomenal feature short, which is just a sociological, creative documentary I mean, it, it covers the whole spectrum of engagement, and uh, uh, so I don't know. Did you were you able to view that, Jamon? Did you see that? And did you have any feedback, comments? Oh yes, um, yes, I did see it, and um, I want. I just 
I, when I saw it the first time, and I still say the same thing, and that is that um, it sometimes it is good for us to have the, the typical documentary where you have the historian talking heads sitting there telling all of this history. But it's also good to hear these narratives of regular folk and have them talk about their experiences that take us outside of what we would normally hear from a person whose um, profession is to tell about this stuff. And so I, I, you, I, you get as much, if not more, insight from hearing from regular folk tell the narratives of their lives and how it interfaces with this history, this geography, and this culture. Um, and so I, I thought it was very informative. Well, the, the, yeah, I, I think there will be concurrence all the way around about that because it, it, it's so true. Um, now there's another, we're going we're gonna to continue our discussion. We're going to take a little turn here because another great street here in, uh, is Woodward Avenue, which is also called by many people America's Road. And the reason we're making mention of the American Road because it ties into Martin Luther King, who, uh, along with political and labor leaders, marched down Woodward for the Detroit Walk to Freedom, which is where they wound up at Cobo Hall, where King delivered his I Have a Dream speech. And if we've got people, anybody from out of state or who didn't know that, this is a significant uh, aspect of uh, the story that we're telling here in celebration of King's birthday that Detroit was the home of that first Detroit walk to, to freedom and the importance of and where he delivered his speech. Now, what's interesting, anytime you have a, a, a big event like this, there are always anniversaries to celebrate. And in the case of the uh, Detroit walk to freedom, there was a 50th anniversary event that I'm proud to say the Black Historic Sites Committee and Detroit Historical Museum sponsored uh, a Freedom Breakfast Buffet that was in 2013 to commemorate that anniversary of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, which that particular demonstration was one of the largest at that time in the country, 125,000 people marched down Woodward. And, and uh, in the 50th anniversary, we held an event to, and brought in, you know, union people. And yes, this, these are some of the people we had who partnered with us. And yes, that is C.T. Vivian at the podium there, who sadly we lost in July, 2020. And then you can see there's Al Sharpton, there's Jesse Jackson. This was at the Detroit Historical Museum. And uh, it was a significant acknowledgement, a milestone yet again. And every time we have a milestone commemoration, we revisit um, the teachings of, of our leaders and hopefully it can make a difference. And I, I thought it was just an opportunity as we were looking at street names that Martin Luther King went down America's uh, street and it was a very important and in that event you had the UAW leader at the time uh, with uh, March down with uh, King. You had a C.L. Franklin, Aretha Franklin's uh, father was there and he was the one C.L. Franklin who uh, applied through city government, through the city council, to actually sponsor the march. So, you know, the, when we bring together the grassroots, the clergy, the church, and uh, uh, the council and politics, it all creates an opportunity for, the, you know, social justice moving forward. Um, that was a major event. I, I just wanted to take a moment out and, and show that and share that with people because they may not know or realize that that actually took place. Um, now, one of the things, the challenges we're facing today as we're moving forward as a country is how do we unite? And uniting around uh, activities such as making decisions about what's happening 
in our urban planning is an opportunity, uh, I think, and um, that's something we'd like to see continue. Now, the question is, Jamal, I'm going to have you address this. Is there an effort to change the uh, Rosa Parks Boulevard name? Are you aware of that? What's happening on that front? Yes, I am. So yes, there is an effort of some of the people, the residents uh, of the neighborhood where 12th Street used to be, but is now Rosa Parks, to rename it um, 12th Street. One of the major reasons for that is because when it was 12th Street, it and if was. People who don't know, not to interrupt you, the man, if we have people who don't know, what okay. is the significance of 12th Street in Detroit yeah. history? Yeah, so 12th Street, of course, was a major thoroughfare when it came to businesses. There was a business strip from um, West Grand Boulevard on 12th Street all the way to Chicago, where, we, where you're entering Boston Edison residential neighborhood. On that strip, there were restaurants, stores, shops, cleaners, um, um, shoe, shoe repair, uh, everything you would need in that community was on 12th Street. And of course, on um, July um, 23rd, 1967, there will be a five-day uprising in the city of Detroit, a five-day rebellion, and much of 12th Street will be destroyed in that rebellion. So there will be businesses that will be burned and looted. There will be fires that will um, destroy a lot of the neighborhood, and there will be an inability for people to re- um, create that neighborhood. But as people are trying to do something in that neighborhood, by the time we get to the 70s, um, Rosa Parks, who lives in that neighborhood, has been living in the city of Detroit since 1957 and is the leader of the Virginia Park. She's the president of the Virginia Park um, um, neighborhood organization. Um, the street is renamed in her honor. Um, mm -hmm. So it becomes Rosa Parks Boulevard. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but it doesn't have all of the restaurants and businesses anymore because we lost those during the 1967 uprising. And so there are people who live there when it was all of the restaurants, all the stores who want that name. They have nostalgia for that name when it had all those things and they want it to be renamed 12th Street because that's how they grew up with it. And they want somebody to begin, they, they want to be a part of the reestablishing of that as a business strip in a cultural neighborhood. Um, and so they want, the, they want it to be renamed 12th Street. Earl, when, as a, a native Detroiter who's now on the West Coast, were you aware of that? And we show the intersection of Rosa Parks Boulevard and Martin Luther King, which might, could become 12th Street. Were you aware of this activity at all? No, uh, thank you, uh, Jamar, for bringing that to light. That's I, I had no idea about that being something that's happening right now. You know, uh, I, I grew up a, a bit over there. My grandmother lived on Calvert off of Dexter. Oh, yeah. oh, and, you know, yeah. I was uh, over there a lot as a child, you know, going to school and stuff like that. So um, I, I wasn't aware of that situation. And even, you know, when I go back home to the city, I, I've noticed that, you know, a, a lot of that area has, you know, a lot of other cultures have started to kind of move in especially in the Boston Edison district. That's right, that's right. Well, um, from, uh, you know, people from different, uh, you know, communities and whatnot are trying to, which is, you know, positive, but um, I definitely don't want to lose the historical history of, of our leaders, you know, MLK, Rosa, people like that. So I I'm glad you brought that to light, Jamon, and I definitely will do more research to try to um, be a part of uh, keeping um, our, our landmarks where they are. You know, right. um, I, I'm, thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. Right. And you kind of touched on something, Earl, that, that in, in Detroit is experiencing this with certain neighborhoods as opposed yep. to streets. In some cases, they're neighborhoods. Uh, and Detroit is definitely a city of neighborhoods. Um, and uh, gentrification, is that going to be something that, that right. is having an impact right. on neighborhoods? And that obviously the streets are a part of that, but it, it, it is. It, it, Jermon is touching a little bit on that, that uh, or where you're mentioning that this, this is something that is happening right now. Derek, can you weigh on on this? Can you see a, a conflation of gentrification, street naming, anything going on in any of your studies that you've done? Yes, yeah, so, no, thank you for the question. Uh, I, I, I'll probably uh, want to dive into Detroit because I just don't know enough about the city and, and my colleagues here really know much more than I do, uh, having lived and worked there. But I will say that 
the renaming of places is a very popular mechanism of what we call rebranding places. So okay. what uh, Jamon is describing isn't simply a street address change. It's an attempt to rebrand the neighborhood or the community in a way to, as they hope, not just to harken back to an earlier time, but to, to basically situate it for a better level of investment and a better level of consumption. And one, what one has to really be very careful of is that those names can become, you know, very powerful symbols. And we have to make sure that we're not wrapping that name change into a process that will dispe uh, displace and dispossess people who have a right to sort of, you know, their neighborhood. Um, and, and I will say that, you know, outside of the situation we're talking about in Detroit, it's not very, um, it's pretty common to find that when people want to redevelop an area, they engage in renaming. And, and in some cases, it allows them to rediscover a history. And in some cases, it allows them to sort of wipe that history from sort of the public landscape. And, and this seems to be a, a very interesting case because it's a bringing back of a memory, but it's also then replacing one that was also pretty important too. That's interesting. Introducing that term rebranding is, is, is so critical because it can, you know, signal something that might erase a history or attempt to promote something new that's coming along. And it could be attract some and offend others in, in that endeavor. And uh, I know that Detroit has streets uh, and this is, uh, could be applicable in other places around the country that a name for individuals whose past has a certain kind of um, impact on African Americans that people may not be, take offense with. In the case of Detroit, the I'm gonna go back to you on this, there are some streets that have uh, been named for slaveholders. Yes. Should uh, that be changed? Does it erase the past to say that happened and therefore this is part of this, or you know, that's an interesting question. Yes, um, Detroit has about 18 streets named after slave owners, and about 12 of them are named after slave owners who were slave owners right here in the city of Detroit. So, um, one of the things that it does is it, in many cases, they were they were they were named in that they were those streets were named um, um, after those slave owners because of their the honor that the city had for these people some of these people were the mayors of the city of detroit some of them were congressmen in the city of detroit some of them were the largest business owners in the city of detroit some of them would have helped the co-founders of some of the major institutions that come out of the city of detroit and so they was done to honor them however for African Americans, and in Detroit now is a predominantly African American city. It wasn't when those streets were named after those slave owners, but it is now. What you're saying is that the honor and greatness of those people uh, should supersede their enslaving of other human beings. And so, they, to me, it does send a message that you have streets named after slave owners in a city that's overwhelmingly African American. Um, it would be, to me, tantamount as to naming um, schools or reservation uh, or schools or streets on a in indigenous person's reservation after native people who were murderers of native americans you know it, to me it's tantamount to that which which native americans wouldn't stand for they would they would they would do everything they could to protest that from happening and so i feel the same way about those streets named after slave owners now that's different than a monument or a marker so a monument or a marker can also tell the history of that person's slave owning history. But a street name can't tell you that. It's just honoring the person. That's all it does. It doesn't get, you can't have a little history um, uh, under the street signs, everywhere the street sign is. So um, you're just honoring that person and, and, and showing tribute to them by naming streets after them. And so I believe that, yeah, those streets ought to be one way or another I, I think it's hard to remove, just rename streets because it's very difficult because of course you have to deal with the postal service, you have to deal with businesses who have used that as their address. And so there's a lot of things that have to happen, but gradually, little by little, we need to be, begin working on removing the streets 
named after these prominent slave owners in the city of Detroit. Noel St. Aubin was a major slave owner in the city of Detroit. Of course, we just say St. Aubin today. Alexander Shin is a slave owner in the city of Detroit, but of course we say Shane today. Um, um, Joseph Kampal was one of the largest slave owners in Michigan's history. And of course we had some major street in the city of Detroit. And of course the Macombs were the largest slave owners in Michigan's history. And um, there's a small street in Detroit named after them, but there's a whole county in Michigan named after um, members of that family. So we ought to begin addressing this. And I think people are beginning to know this for a long time. We didn't know Detroit even had slavery. So of course there was no battle to try to deal with these streets because we didn't know. We thought slavery was a Southern phenomenon. That's what we were taught. We were taught that slavery is a ma major issue in the South, but that the North was the good guys. What we've learned now is that slavery was an American phenomenon in places throughout the country had slavery. Um, and all of the 13 colonies had slavery at one point. And before Michigan was part of the United States, it was a French controlled area. And the, the early French um, settlers were slave owners in the city of Detroit. And so we're learning that and now we're beginning to address that, but it's in this early stages because we're just finding this information out. We didn't always know it. That's why history is so important and why education and these kind of programs we hope enlighten and broaden people's understanding and appreciation of what goes into uh, the naming of streets. Um, I'd like to open it up uh, to any q and A. I I don't know if the Q&A function can be seen and if people might have any questions or something they want to put in chat. Hi, and Karen. Oh, sorry. Our panelists. And Malika has come on. She's our liaison, Malika, to the Detroit Historical Society. So what, what, what say you, Malika? Yeah, so we do have a few questions that have been placed oh. in the chat. Okay. Um, the first is, could you talk a bit more about why Kansas City rescinded the King Street name? Earl kind of had talked about that earlier, and uh, maybe you could just do a quick recap of what the background story is behind that renaming or attempt. Yeah, um, you know, again, uh, it's hard to speak because we're not necessarily on ground zero, but from the articles and things that I have read, you know, there was a major thoroughfare that Dr. Uh, Alderman mentioned earlier, the uh, Paseo that ran through the uh, a lot of the city there. And then um, there was uh, some public outcry. And I think similar to what Jamon stated, stated earlier about there was some historical um, attachment to the previous name that the people in Kansas City felt that, you know, taking that name off and naming it MLK was unfair to that past history. And because of that, they were able to um, get the name removed and put back to the original name, which was the pa a Paseo. And now they're trying to find another street for MLK, but there's a lot going on and I'm sure I'm not doing it justice in terms of all the things that are happening, but I would definitely um, uh, encourage people to Google and research that because it's just really wild what's happening down there. So uh, if I can, the only thing I would add, and I think Earl's done a fantastic job capturing it, is that, you know, there's a lot of uh, controversy about process. So uh, around a lot of the street naming, there's a certain procedure or process. And so there's these procedural injustices that people uh, tend to be concerned about. And, and I cannot get into the process of what went on in Kansas City because it was a very thick process, very complicated. Um, but one of the things that Earl hit on that I think is important is that when we talk about heritage, there's the historical heritage of who is remembered or not remembered in the case of these comments by Jamon about slaveholders, this is a superb point he makes. Then there's not just historical heritage, there's place heritage. There's mm -hmm. sort of the history that gets wrapped up around living with and identifying with a place for many, many years. And in some cases in the street naming process, the historical heritage and the place heritage actually can conflict. They can they can butt heads together. And this is when you get some public controversy. And, and, and I would say one last thing about this uh, to build on Jamon's uh, superb points about slaveholders and their names is that, and, and this may be controversial to some, but I've never avoided that, is we, we really need a more regenerative model of the way we remember the past within public spaces. You know, the idea that somehow uh, many generations ago, 
it was seen as appropriate to name a street for a slaveholder and a white supremacist. And now, not just because this is a, a solidly, beautifully rich, rich, uh, rich and plentiful black city, but because of where we are as a country in terms of talking about the past, that's not appropriate anymore. We've got to evolve. We've got to regenerate our public spaces so that they really reflect who we are. And, and I will say one of the most disappointing things I've run into, and I'm not pointing the finger at Kansas City, but I'll say in general, is that people are unwilling to give up some of their place heritage to do what I consider commemorative justice. They're willing to give up that connection to a place and what's comfortable for them and what's convenient for them because they're unwilling to really make right what has been wrong for so long. Well, participants, you just had a seminar just for what Derek has said on cultural geography. That is that everything that has been said that there is applies to the, this discussion. It is something to keep in mind as you move forward. Keep that in mind as there are all the factors that come into play and intersect in making those uh, decisions. Uh, Malika, do you have some more questions? Sure. We do, in fact, we have several more questions. The next is, is there any correlation? And um, Dr. Alderman, this may be one that, um, that you can take first. Um, is there any correlation between African-American population in a city and the presence of a street named after Dr. King? Uh, very good question. In fact, when I first started looking at this issue now back, I'm showing my age, back in the mid 1990s, I started really looking at population figures and it, we have to keep in mind that even though we try to talk, talk about King Streets in a very sort of unified general way, there are a diversity of different places and streets that bear his name. But I will say this is that what we know is that the likelihood of a street being named for King increases dramatically with the proportion of African Americans within a population. And really the magic threshold is about a third. So whenever you have a city with at least a third of its population, which is solidly African-American, people of color, it doesn't always have to be African-American, your likelihood of getting a street name for King is, is greatly higher. That's interesting because in the map that we showed earlier on, I noticed in the North and it looks like Montana, and, uh, some of those states on the border of the United States and Canada had no city, I mean, had no street identified because the population of those areas did not have well have a lot of african-american population there so it's interesting well and and you know to some degree that sort of pattern continues or it's, it's pretty consistent but it's also important to realize is that sometimes you find king's name in communities that are largely white because that white community has embraced a certain part of civil rights heritage uh, I will say that, you know, one of the dangerous things that's going on right now is that uh, in some communities, and I'm not talking about the communities we have represented here, but in, in places, in fact, that I know of, uh, city leaders are very quick to sort of put King's name up on a very small road somewhere. And they, they sort of use that as, okay, I did something good. I did something very just. And I think, I think what we're talking about here are communities that really embrace King's name and memory rather than using it as sort of a PR stunt, which some city officials have tried to do. I, I hope I'm not getting everybody in trouble. I'm sort of speaking my no, mind. No, I, I think we're getting informed. Because I'm, I'm going to piggyback on that, um, um, Derek. Um, so the naming of streets after King has been used in a number of ways, like you just stated. And one way is people embrace the civil rights history and they want to attach themselves to that history and honor that history. And so they name streets in honor of him. That's one way. And of course, another way is to be able to say, hey, we did something and they name an alley or a, a, a two block um, throughway after Dr. King so they can say and point to that and say, see, we, we, we care. So you have that aspect. And then you have these other two competing things that have happened. And I'm really speaking in Mich about Michigan right now. And um, so when I talk about streets named after slave owners or streets named after white supremacists, there's always, and you, you, just so everybody knows this, the minute you bring this up and talk about doing something about it, there's gonna be a group of people who will come out and say, 
that's history. You know, these people did other great things. They'll find all kinds of ways to not deal with addressing the name of that street being changed. But when you're talking about that in the city of Detroit, so I, of course, I've been a part of this for a while of talking about these streets and talking about doing something about these streets. The majority of the people who attack this, of course, are non-Detroiters, but there are some Detroiters who feel that way too. And Detroit is surrounded by about 180 suburbs. So if you go 15 miles in any direction around the city of Detroit, you got all these suburbs. And if you go 15 miles either way, adding them all up, it's about 180 suburbs, uh, maybe 25 miles. 25 miles out, you got 180 some suburbs. None of them that are predominantly white have a street named after Martin Luther King Jr. They'll fight for a street to be still named a, a, after a slave owner in the city of Detroit, but they won't even, their cities don't even have a street named after, not a, a racist, not a person who was anti-white, but a person who was pro-civil rights. So it's okay for a predominantly black community to have to stomach a slave owner as a street name or a school name, but it's not even okay to have a civil rights leader have a street or school named after them in their street, in their, in their um, city. So that's one thing. Then the other thing is using Martin Luther King Jr. So if you go further out in, the, in Michigan, like Lansing, um, Martin Luther King Jr. is used as a weapon. So um, in, if you don't know, Malcolm X grew up in Lansing, Michigan. Mm. It was in Lansing, Michigan, where his, his father will be killed on a streetcar on Detroit and Michigan Avenue, all right? So he's killed at a streetcar, and we, most of us believe, most historians believe it was by a white supremacist organization, either the Ku Klux Klan themselves or the derivative organization, the Black Legion. So he's murdered. Uh, his family is broken up. And activists in Lansing fought to have a historical marker placed where his home used to be on Logan Street. And so eventually in 1975, a marker was placed on Logan Street where Malcolm X's home as a child growing up was. Now it was hard to see that marker because they kind of hidden it behind an apartment complex. So you have to kind of know it's there. You can't just stumble on it. You have to know it's there to go. So that's the first issue that when it got put up, it was put up to hide it. And of course, there's a reason why Lansing wants to hide the history of Malcolm X, because it's a very sorry history of how his family was treated by the city, by the county, by the courts, by the authorities in Lansing. It's a very sorry history of what happened to Malcolm's family in, um, in Lansing, Michigan. So they hide the marker. And then shortly after, shortly after the marker goes up, the street name is changed from Logan to Martin Luther King. So you got finally get that we're going to honor Malcolm being born, I mean, not born, but growing up. He wasn't born here, but he grew up uh, in, in Lansing, Michigan. And to, after that, they, the street is not named Malcolm X. It's named Martin Luther King. Not that Martin Luther King doesn't deserve a street named after him, but this is done as a strike, as a weapon against Malcolm's history. And so years later, um, Michi Lansing finally makes us a, a smaller street they name a smaller street after Malcolm X, but that the street being named Martin Luther King Jr. in um, Lansing was not done to honor Martin Luther King. It was to take a swipe at Malcolm's history. And so we get all of these reasons why streets are named for Martin Luther King Jr. and why streets aren't named after Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr. is not good enough until he's being used against Malcolm. So it's not good enough to name a street after him until you, until Malcolm shows up. Now, once Malcolm shows up, then Martin becomes something that you want to honor. And that's a part of this history, too. Excellent, Jamon. Excellent points made all the way around. Um, uh, there's, I think there was a comment from someone who didn't live too far from uh, what you were just talking about, Martin, you know, in the Lansing area. Uh, Malika, do we have more questions or comments you'd like to share? Actually do. Um, there is a question, um, which may have been spoken to a bit, but there might be some, some additional information um, that, might, that you might want to add here. And that is, why are most MLK boulevards located in urban areas only? Which I, I do think there's been quite a lot spoken to, but if there's anything um, that any of the panelists would like to add. 
if it's okay, I can jump in here. Um, I, I do think probably uh, the majority of those streets are in fact uh, in urban areas, but it is important to realize that that's not always the case. So particularly when you go down to the southeastern United States, and this is a pattern I, I discovered uh, pretty early in my work, you started seeing King Streets, and, and as Jamon makes a point, they're named for a variety of reasons, but you started seeing King Streets across the urban hierarchy. They were in very small places, rural areas. They were in medium-sized cities and, of course, the big metro areas that we all know about. Um, uh, one of the more fascinating of these is in Cuba, Alabama. Uh, Cuba, Alabama has a Martin Luther King Street, which I don't know if it's yet paved or not, and it maybe has one or two people who live on that road. Uh, it was highlighted in the documentary now almost about 20 years ago. Um, there are many other examples where you can actually, if you go on um, uh, Street View within Google Map and you look up certain Martin Luther King streets, you can actually follow and how they run through countrysides. In fact, the very first Martin Luther King Street that I really took notice of um, before I even got into graduate school is I was visiting my in-laws um, and they live in Eatonton, Georgia, which is the birthplace of Alice Walker. And I was riding along a really pretty rural road and found a Martin Luther King Street on the side and stopped right in the middle of the road to my wife's uh, chagrin. And I sat there and asked and wondered, how did that street get here on that little countryside? You know, um, and that's what actually launched me to get very interested in understanding the renaming process. So I didn't mean to be biographical, but you do find a lot of urban areas, but you do find them in small towns and rural areas, which I think is really uh, makes for some interesting case studies in the future. You know, as I'm listening to this, it would be an interesting exercise if we have any teachers in the audience today <laughs> as a teaching point, uh, you know, a project to say, visit the Martin Luther King Boulevard in your community, walk it, and kind of describe what you've experienced and what you'd like to see to make an improvement. And, you know, I, I think it, there's so much to what you're just saying there that was really triggered by your thought. You know, the uh, going into these different communities and seeing from small, mid-sized, how did this street get its name? And they could research and say, how did this street get its name? Was there an effort to change the street name? What is the street name today? And to, to really share that, it's, it's another approach to history that makes it a little, and a testament to uh, the memory of Dr. King as well. So, um, and yeah, and, and, and if, if I can jump in real quick, I mean, Jamon's point about Lansing is just superb. I mean, right. it, it, you know, you ride by that street and you see King's name, and, and he's exactly right. The, the street sign cannot unpack that history. Yeah. You've got to unpack it. And you start learning about these dynamic relationships and the way street names get weaponized and the way people uh, have these territorial struggles. And, and I think the whole issue of history, you know, using these street names and, their, and, and, the, and these communities to unlock histories, unlock histories, not just the history of the renaming, but the history of the road. And, and how that road got to look the way it does, you know, or, or, or what is the history of struggle along that road? And, and I think for far too long, America, and I'm really talking about white America in particular, has been sort of riding along the street and passing by these street signs, and they're not really caring about the history. They're not unlocking and unpacking these histories the way they need to be. I think the classroom is a per perfect place to do it. Okay, very good. I think, Karen, this serves as a great segue into the next question, which is what can we do in our communities? And Karen, you've already provided a great example, but what can we do in our communities to uphold the good name of MLK? Irene shared that question. Well, Irene, if we think that we've kind of hit on something and if people want to put in chat some of their ideas and thoughts, if anything comes off the top of our heads of our panelists, go for it. Also did want to, uh, I think it may help with that question as well, that um, there are some streets that are actually uh, doing uh, quite well in thriving areas. And Dr. Alderman probably can speak better to that, but places like Tampa, Savannah, you know, and things like that. 
uh, that are actually placed in a proper, you know, at least that we would feel would be a proper uh, uh, representation of, of MLK and his uh, diverse, uh, you know, platforms and things of that nature. So, uh, Dr. Adam, I would definitely love to hear more about kind of those places that actually are in, uh, you know, great places and are thriving and are actually doing, doing quite well. Well, you know, Earl, we had a, a gentleman, uh, uh, Deshay Agui, who mm -hmm. was on your Martin Luther King Boulevard block party event last night, who works in Milwaukee. And, and, and Milwaukee is one of those places that has really pumped a lot of investment and a lot of thought into sort of the state of its Martin Luther King Street. Um, you know, and, and, and I, I, you know, if you go to Austin, Texas, Austin, Texas is a city that, you know, its street uh, cuts across some racial economic boundaries. You go to Albuquerque, New Mexico, that's not a street you would normally think of of a heavy African-American presence, but it's named a major thoroughfare for King that runs uh, uh, right up to the University of New Mexico. Um, and, and, you know, I think that's part of the challenge is to, um, again, storytelling, but also story collecting. You know, this is where uh, j historians like Jamon and filmmakers like Earl and, and the things that uh, Karen and her colleagues are involved in, this is powerful. I mean, what's the best way of helping? The best way of helping is to, is to talk to people and to learn their stories and to find out, you know, what is their life like on these streets and what can be done to address them. And then holding our officials accountable for those stories. Because those stories are individual, but they're part of a larger structural collective whole. Sure. Uh, I want to, I want to, um, first, before I answer that question, I want Malika, if you please um, could restate that restate that, that question. I want to make sure I'm answering the real the question that you actually asked. Sure. Um, the question from Irene was, "What can we do in our communities to uphold the good name of MLK?" Ah, okay. Thank you. So, what I uh, propose for to do for that, particularly in places like Detroit and Chicago and New York and in LA and places like that. So I think it's easy to do in Atlanta, you know, so it's easy to, 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 to uphold the name of King in Atlanta or in Montgomery, Alabama. But in the places like Detroit and Chicago, who some many times may feel that they're aloof or separate from King's history. Um, Karen talked about the fact that King led the march down Woodward, which at that time was the largest civil rights march in history it would be surpassed just two months later by the March on Washington. And of course, he would give a portion of the I Have a Dream speech in the city of Detroit before he gave it in, in Washington, DC. So, but even bigger than that, King came to Detroit probably 20 or so, 20, 20 sometimes, if not more. He had family in the city of Detroit. And so he had been here a lot. When he first comes here, he's 16 years old and it's 1945. And there's been a race riot in the city of Detroit. He's at Second Baptist Church. And what he's seeing is the results of a, a year, uh, about five years of tension, the building of the Burwood Wall, the segregation wall on the northwest side of the city of Detroit, the um, fight at the Sojourner Truth housing projects in 1942, which is on the northeast side of the city of Detroit, the race riot, which began at Belle Isle in 1943. So he's seeing that. And so he, now he's getting a little bit of education on the ground education about northern versions of racism because of course he's very familiar with the south but the northern version he's getting a ground level history uh, of learning this and then in 1954 when he comes as a guest pastor a guest minister at second baptist to give a, a sermon rediscovering lost values he says at the beginning of the speech after talking about this history of second baptist in its role in the Underground Railroad, its role in civil rights. He talks about the fact that you can see that things are messed up. It doesn't, you don't have to look far to see that things are messed up. Now it's 1954, what is he talking about? That you don't have to look far to see what things are messed up. They've already begun destroying Black Bottom. That's what he's talking about. So he's talking about the fact that he sees urban renewal, which Black people in Detroit are calling Negro removal. He sees that. That's not a Southern freedom struggle fight uh, discussion. He's talking about a Northern phenomenon that's happening in places like Detroit, in places like Chicago, in places like New York. So now he's interspersing that into his speeches. 
When he comes four times in 1958, he's going to visit Detroit four times in 1958. He's just published his book or just written his book and it's published, Stride Toward Freedom, which is mm -hmm. about the Montgomery bus boycott. Mm -hmm. he's, given a, he's given a tour. So before I was giving tours, before I was born, Representative Congressman Charles Diggs gives Martin Luther King Jr. a tour of Paradise Valley and basically showing him the beginning of the destruction of Paradise Valley. Black Bottom is gone by 1958, but now they've begun tearing down Paradise Valley. And so now King is going to add these kinds of things into his speeches in the North. And I'm just, I'm talking about Detroit, but Chicago is showing him things. New York is showing him things. Cleveland is showing him things. Boston is showing him things. I'm talking about Detroit because I'm much more familiar with that, but I know that he's going to other Northern cities and learning how Jim Crow works in the North, which is a little bit different than how it works in the South. And he's adding that to his speech. So when he comes to 63 and leads that march and gives that speech, before he gets to the I have a dream portion, he's not talking about churches being bombed in the South. I mean, he mentions this, but what he's talking about is educational inequality in the North. So he's talking about how schools are segregated in the North, not by a, not by a law, but by the fact that black people live on one side of town because of housing segregation and whites live on the other and the resources are placed in the schools where white people live versus where black people live. He he's knows this because he's been interfacing with the North. He's been interfacing with Detroit. So he knows about job discrimination. He knows that black people are the last hire and the first fire at Ford Motor Company, at GM, at, at um, the Fisher Body Plant. He knows this because he's been interfacing with these Detroit folks not because he learned it in Montgomery, not because he learned it in Birmingham or Atlanta, he learned it by coming to these places. So what we have to talk about if we wanna honor King is we have to not only talk about how King br brought us a new vision, but how we in places like Detroit, Chicago, New York, gave King a new or added portion to his vision. King would not have arrived at a poor people's movement by 1968 which he is going to get assassinated, had it not been the imprint of the North on him. He, had, he would not have expanded his vision to talking about militarism and housing segregation and the poor, how the poor are treated and capitalist exploitation. He wouldn't have expanded his vision to all of that had it not been from the impact of places like Detroit on him. Motown will, will, will re record Martin Luther King Jr. speeches after he speaks in the city of Detroit in 1963, Barry Gordy works out a deal to record Martin Luther King Jr.'s speeches. Detroit changed King and moved King just as much as King moved the nation. You know, Jamon Boy, he, he, he gets a roll and, and I can see if we could have applause, <laughs> virtual applause there. Um, there was a Grammy award for that particular uh, recording that you're talking about. And then there's the other America which is a speech that King gave at Gross Point South where he talked about what you just said, Javon, you've got two Americas. You got America that, that uh, has poverty and inequality, you got other America that, that's kind of doing quite well. And that was a major speech and people were interested in, um, you know, you can Google and just see the other America. And uh, it was given at a gymnasium there, what is, what, at what is now Gross Point South, and there is actually a plaque that students had erected outside that gymnasium, you know, that injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. So that impact carried of that speech, um, you know, and we're, we're really getting a whole lesson in the history because we have a historian, we have a professor, we have a filmmaker, creator, all of this is really, um, uh, bubbling up so much about the history and why it's so important and fascinating. So, to my mind, that was perfect. That was a very, very interesting um, verbal essay, I would say, on uh, that that topic. And um, I don't know. Do we have any more questions, Malika? I, I very, I hate to almost interrupt, but I'm fascinated with what what else might be, uh, and we might wrap up early. But if we have some more questions. Well, we actually have four more questions, Ooh, Karen. Questions. <laughs> um, Go ahead, knock it out. However, they are mostly tied to mapping and the physical placement of 
MLK streets, drives, boulevards. Um, the first question or next question, I should say, we've had several questions this afternoon. Um, looking at the map where cities have an MLK street, it is primarily in the eastern part of the U.S. This is Antonia. Is there any reason why more cities in the western part of the U.S. don't have cities renaming the street? African Americans live throughout the United States. Great question. And, yes, and, and um, great, great, great answer that, that all of these uh, panelists will give you an answer to, and I think they've touched in it in, in terms of their responses and the kind of coalescing it to answer that question. Derek, why don't you start? No, I, I was going to say is uh, first I need to sort of caution folks. Um, so that map, while it provides a lot of information, uh, no map is ever complete. Um, you know, it's, it's always based on as much data as you can find. So there's probably some places that have named streets for King that are not on that map. And in fact, one of the things that's the hardest thing to track down is when people don't really rename a street, but they sort of dedicate a street to King, which is not an address change. It's just an honorary designation. That kind of thing doesn't show up really well in the data. The other thing to keep in mind is that that's only a map of people or places that have named streets. It doesn't count the places that have named schools, not the places that have named parks, not the places that have dedicated various physical or, or uh, facilities or preserved history that Jaman is so, so beautifully detailing for us. But I will say this, if I was going to be hard pressed to explain that, if you think about the dynamics of the Great Migration, the move out of the South uh, in the early 20th century, leading all the way up into the mid 20th century, you, you had African-Americans leaving the rural South and the urban South and moving to major cities in the Northeast, the Midwest and the West. And so uh, what you're seeing, I think in that map is really sort of a heavy urban concentration of prominent African-American communities in Western large cities. And so it shows up as not that many streets named for King uh, versus the East because Again, African-Americans in the East were more distributed across a whole lot of different kinds of places, small, medium, and large. Oh, excellent, okay. Um, Malik, you, you said you had four questions. That was one, what else is on the uh, people's minds today? I think, did we lose Malika there for a minute? What happens when you unmute and then inadvertently mute yourself? Welcome to Zoom world. Um, so I'm gonna combine um, two questions that are quite similar from um, Margaret and Leslie, who are asking about um, countries outside of the US with streets named after Dr. King. Um, so have we looked at, um, done any sort of surveys around, around that and what kind of information might you be, might you be able to share? Well, I don't know a lot. I, I you know, did a Google um, search for countries throughout the globe that have named streets for Martin Luther King and came back um, with, uh, you know, France probably leading in the number, uh, but, you know, the rationale for why they decided to make that call is name the street. That required more research that hasn't been undertaken. So the panelists may know more, but in terms of the global reach, that, that would be interesting to know uh, what was the driver behind it. Uh, but there are many, you know, uh, over 100 streets outside of the United States that are named for Martin Luther King. Yeah, the, the only thing that I can add is that uh, I think it was uh, around the uh, 50th anniversary of of Dr. King's murder. Uh, National Geographic put out a special issue of their magazine where they did a pretty investigative reporting of some of the uh, global examples of naming streets for Dr. King. And, and, and I know uh, Karen has already referenced some of their information. Uh, and they're found throughout Europe. They're found uh, in, in parts of South America. They're uh, uh, found in, in India. They're found in, you know, uh, we don't have a full accounting of these streets and that's actually a beautiful research study for someone to do. And I think the other part of that research study would be to understand really what are the motivations. And I, you know, 
if I had to take, take a speculation, you know, King is a global figure. I think sometimes in this country we lose, and I'm not saying the people here on the Zoom lose sight of this because I think we all aware of it, but in large parts of other communities, they lose sight of the fact that King is a legendary global figure and that he is a, you know, a real symbol for not just civil rights, but human rights. And so some countries have, you know, some of the very first renaming of things for King actually happened outside the U.S. And so while we like to sort of claim and think that King is ours, he is, he belongs to the world. And a really a, a beacon for democracy, nonviolence. And early on, we said Haiti in 1968 named a street for Martin Luther King. So that, that just goes to your point. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. And it could be a project for anybody who's doing global studies or traveling internationally anytime soon. And they have one in South Africa, uh, anybody who's traveling there. So um, interesting. Malik, any more questions? There's one last question um, from Margaret. There was an attempt in Atlanta to name a street for Coretta Scott King. Does anybody know whether or not that happened? No. When did, when, well, uh, does the individual know when that might have occurred? I'd have to do a quick Google, uh, only because that's interesting if that was in the post-civil rights era meeting going through the 80s and 90s to, to, not, to now, as opposed to when many of these streets maybe were named in the post-civil rights era, in the civil rights era. Uh, and when did that action take place, the attempt take place to uh, name the street for Coretta Scott King? Because I think it would make sense. I, I don't know the exact answer to that, but I, I, do, I will point out that in Jacksonville, North Carolina, uh, it's, it's basically like a, a highway. It's not what we think of a traditional street. Uh, they have a road that's named after Dr. King and Coretta Scott King together. Oh. And oh, uh, it's, uh, I, 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 I'm always putting myself in these situations. I almost ran into a guardrail trying to get a picture of the thing. So uh, I'm not a, a safe person to be around when it comes to these streets. But, uh, you know, it brings up a great point, Karen. I don't know if it's okay to spin off on this. I really think one of the next big sort of agenda items for us as we think about remembering people through street names and this regenerating of America's public spaces is honoring really the, the, uh, important, Afri uh, the, the important women of the movement. Uh, right. and, and, you know, we've seen Chicago is now named a street for Ida B. Wells. Uh, yeah. There's been murmurings in other places about naming streets for the legendary Ella Baker. Right. Um, and, and Coretta Scott King, obviously, is part of that. But there are many, many more. The point is, is that, uh, and of course, Rosa, Rosa Parks was an early example of that. But now we're starting to see a push in many communities to broaden the pantheon of heroes and heroines that uh, that are remembered um, because you know you know Jamon's point about the fact that so many slave owners are remembered you know we, we remember a lot of white men um, we really relatively speaking whether it's white or black or of other ethnicities remember very few women yeah. there's a, a gender inequality that's built into many of the streets uh, and street names that's very right uh, you're right on point uh, um, Dr. Alderman um, yeah, that's one of the things that I really, at, when I began doing my tours and began being a teacher, you know, I, I was fighting a fight, or I thought I was fighting a fight of, of bringing African American history um, to places that didn't already have it. So the, some of the schools I first taught at, that wasn't a major part of the history lessons was African American history. So I, I fought the fight of trying to bring that in. But even after I did all that, what I've found, and, and I have to start with myself, my, me, myself, and the schools and textbooks in general didn't talk about women, didn't talk about black women. So if it was um, history, it was mainly focused on, on white people's history. If it was um, women's history, it was really about white women. So the women's movement was white women. And if it was black history, it was about black men. So black women were left out of all of these stories. And so now what I found is that if you're really talking about black history and you study it, you find that 
Women are at every part of it. There's no part of any progress that Black people have made in this country where women weren't at the forefront of it. So if you're talking about the Underground Railroad, the women are in the background of the Underground Railroad. They're in the forefront of the Underground Railroad. If you're talking about the Civil Rights Movement, as you mentioned, Ida B. Wells, women are at the forefront of the Civil Rights Movement, the Labor Movement, the Black Power Movement, starting businesses, starting churches, whatever progress that African Americans are made, making or made, Black women are at the forefront of it. So if you're talking about Black history and you're not talking about Black women, you're not talking about Black history. So I have had to learn that lesson. I didn't, I have to admit, I didn't start out knowing this. I developed the fact that I was, much of my history was patriarchal. You know, I was talking about what the men did and leaving all these women out. And so I learned as I have been doing this for years now that I was wrong and that is no part of black history that does not include the significant and sometimes overwhelming contributions of black women. Well, you make a good point. Last year, uh, 2019, we had an exhibit at the Detroit Historical Museum uh, on the Negro Leagues and the Detroit Stars, but there was a special panel for African-American women who own baseball teams. Oh. Ethel Manley and Tony Stone. Those names are written away I and mean, people just don't know. So very good point that history has been, um, you know, slighted women, black women in particular through the years, but there, there, it pops up every once in a while, there's opportunity and uh, Derek, you make a good point. The two, study two, and examination of that is, is gonna be important. Two years ago, we, we honored um, Dr. Rosa Gregg, who was the president of the Detroit Association of Colored Women's Clubs in the 1940s at the clubhouse. Her granddaughter was there um, and we honored her by, by naming that street, giving the honorary name of that street, Dr. Rosa L. Gregg Avenue. Um, and so um, right on the corner of Brush and Ferry, where the headquarters sits, is the, the renaming of that street. And of course, once as we, we see these street names, even the honorary names, when they have a name like Dr. Rosa L. Grad, somebody's gonna to wanna to look that up. Who is who right. was that? And so, you know, if it just had Grag Avenue, then nobody would think that even, they wouldn't think about that. But when you name it after the whole name, Rosa L. Grag Avenue, somebody's going to say, well, who was that? And they're gonna look that up and find out this intricate history that she's important in. She was an advisor to three presidents, uh, Roosevelt, Kennedy, and Johnson. She right. is um, a leader in voting rights and education. She owns a number of black businesses in Paradise Valley and outside of Paradise Valley. She starts a school for black people and black women in the city of Detroit. All of this history is hidden history. And sometimes we can make it come out by adding their names to these streets. And Coretta Scott King has a street name up there in Marion, Alabama, which is where she's from. She was from Marion, Alabama. And so there's a street named after her there. I, I don't know if there's streets in other places, but I know in Marion, Alabama, there's a street named after her there. Well, Jamal, you're giving some rich opportunities for the Black Historic Sites Committee, which I said at the beginning, we're concerned about uh, the history, places and events and people who've contributed African-Americans to uh, Detroit and Michigan history. And there's a wealth of opportunity that you've just presented today for us to, to get busy with, which is really good because what we do that we can share with schools and educators and others makes a big difference in terms of what people learn and understand about uh, our society. Um, do we have any more questions or anything from chat? Because I think what I'm going to do um, is we're going to, we might start to wind up, but I don't want to cut it short at all. But I think that we have covered so much ground uh, and I'm glad we're recording this because I may have to go back and listen. There, there are some salient points and insights that were made about uh, how the, the politics and sociology and a lot of factors come into play that influence power uh, and, and street naming. And of course, Earl, I want to give you an opportunity to say, because your creative short film is amazing. I don't know if you indicated where, how uh, one, if they're interested, can contribute to uh, what is needed to complete the full feature-length film. Sure, um, we'll quickly um, 
all the information, ways to support, uh, ways to kind of um, just be a part of what we're trying to do, support the mission here. Uh, you can find that on King Boulevard dot uh, KingBoulevardFeatureFilm.com. So K I N G. Yeah. Yeah. B L V D F E A T U R E uh, Film F I L M dot com. So KingBoulevardFeatureFilm.com. All the information is there. Please support. Uh, you know, any uh, reach out to us. Any questions or anything like that that you have, and definitely uh, appreciate you having us today. And uh, really looking forward to just moving forward and allowing uh, this year to uh, be a year of movement for all of us and for um, celebrating all of our histories in terms of people who've gone before us and done great things. So, well, it's fantastic. I, I know in previous years, as I said earlier, we'd have people coming in and doing presentations. One advantage of Zoom is we have Derek in Tennessee, we have right. Irwin, California, we have Jermaine in Detroit. And there are people, I'm sure, maybe outside of the state of Michigan who tuned in as well. So we couldn't have done this without that technology, which really is uh, uh, ha has uh, provided an opportunity for people to listen and learn. I want to thank you all so very, very much. Outstanding insights and history of Martin Luther King Street, the man, the message that we can carry forward. And um, I need to say this, the Black Historic Sites Committee will be continuing to honor uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's memory with input from young people in a program that's scheduled uh, for April 4th that will feature their talent in song, poetry, rap, and artwork on the theme of systemic racism. So these young people are asked to provide their uh, understanding of the practice that today has been front page news, systemic racism and expressing it in song, poetry, rap, and artwork. Uh, they have until March 4th to submit their, uh, uh, what they have to say about uh, systemic racism. And the submissions will be exhibited in, in, throughout the year. So. This is something that um, we'll try to put an email out there for people if they're interested, if you, or you can send an email to us, there'll be more promotion, but I wanted to say that the celebration continues uh, with this next event. Uh, and as we wrap up today, if there are any closing parting thoughts, I wish I had Zoom applause for the panelists. <laughs> you know, if you have any closing thoughts, we're gonna wrap it up. Uh, this journey that we've been through has been quite a journey uh, through what it means to name a street MLK. It's been amazing. Um, I want to thank everyone. If you have any closing thoughts, you can summarize them in 30 seconds each. Oh, no one wants to take that challenge. <laughs> no, I, I'll start. You know, I just want to thank everybody for uh, joining us today on this uh, day to celebrate uh, the man that uh, was and is uh, Dr. Martin, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. So we are definitely uh, happy to uh, have everyone here. And I just wanna say thank you again. And um, it's definitely, we're better together as we try to move this uh, you know, country forward and this world forward. And I know the times have been a bit turbulent with uh, the last couple of weeks with you know, politics and all these things that we uh, have seen. But I think uh, Dr. King is a great example of how we can really um, you know, fight the negativity with love and, and peace and you know, uh, just a, a, a smart way to counteract all these crazy things that are happening. So um, however you do it, just keep going. You know, uh, really happy to be a part of the panel and just uh, have a great day. So uh, thank you so much. Okay, great. Any other closing thoughts? I, well, I, I just want to uh, express my thanks once again for being allowed to be part of this fine event and being able to interact and, and uh, learn from my colleagues here. And Jamon, I'm just in, in awe. I could listen to you all day, man. Yeah, great. Uh, fantastic. Um, uh, you know, the, the last thing I will say about this is that what we've created here, and I'm so proud to be part of, is a space of dialogue. Oh, yes. and, and I know talk can only get you so far in this world. 
because change is not always about talking. Mm -hmm. But I think talking is certainly important to the road to change. And and I think that you know if 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 I could have the power and the and and work with others to sort of have things happen, I would love to see these kinds of dialogues happen in so many different streets along America, uh, on Martin Luther King Street, and I, that's a pretty fitting tribute, you know. Again, not letting the talk be the only goal, but have that talk lead to transformative change because because Dr. King was an agent of change. Well, thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank everybody. I, I, I really enjoyed and learned some things today. Um, of course, I enjoyed the film. I enjoyed everyone's discussion. And of course, I really um, like, um, I, even though I'm a historian, I, I, I dabble in trying to learn a lot of what Derek does. And that is really putting this geography with history. And years ago, when I led a tour, to Montgomery, Alabama, and realized it saw just how close Dexter Avenue Baptist Church is to the state capitol. That's when I knew that they, you have to connect these things, geography and history. Those two things are connected, that you have this significant African-American church in deeply enmeshed in the civil rights movement, and then you have the capitol where George Wallace was the governor, and before him, you had other governors who were segregationists. All that happening is so important to understand that history and how it interfaces with geography. And the same thing here in the city of Detroit, understanding where Martin Luther King Jr. led the march down Woodward from Adelaide and Brush Park on Woodward all the way down to Cobo, to the Cobo Arena um, at the riverfront. Understanding that history is important. Understanding that he came here four times in 1958. And one of those times he stayed at the Gotham Hotel, which was the five-star Black-owned hotel in Paradise Valley, or was part of that Paradise Valley history, and where that was, that is part of this, that is important to understand, interfacing history and geography and knowing that the streets you stand on and the places that you're walking past every day have this low lot of history of people, places, and events. Understanding how all that connects to us today is highly important, and I just wish we do it more than what we've always done it. Thank you. Thank you very much, panelists. I, you, I hope we can unify ourselves in the pursuit of justice. This has been fantastic. Thank you to everyone and anyone who has a dream. I hope you have a takeaway from today to share with others. And with that, have a good afternoon.